Hey, Wizards fans, as we conclude the Off the Bench podcast celebrating 25 years of Wizards basketball, Chris Miller alongside Drew Gooden, our very special guest, former Wizard Larry Hughes, who was also a teammate of Drew Gooden's in Cleveland. I can't wait to hear that story. Uh, but first and of all, in Chicago. Chicago. Oh, we're going to get into that, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, Zach, let me tell you that. That's where we started. Yeah, that's where we started. Yeah, that's where we started. You go to Charlotte? I went to Charlotte. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's good to see you, man. Yeah. Welcome home. Oh, man, appreciate, appreciate it. it. Appreciate it. Good to be back. When we ask a lot of these guys this year about coming back, I mean, it started with us, Drew, all the way in Japan in the preseason. Yeah. We had Rip Hamilton on the show. They always talk about just some real special times they had in D.C. What about you? I think it's the same. I mean, I think it's the same with the, the energy uh, that the city generated, obviously having, you know, a decent team. I came in, MJ was, you know, was still in the fold as well. So I came in at, at a good time. But it's always been, you know, love from the city. I mean, even when I was coming here as a, as a visiting player, obviously when I spent my time here and then even leaving and then coming back, the energy has always been, been positive. I mean, what about the energy during the playoff time? Let's talk about that around the city. You want to get into that? Before we do that, though, I, uh -huh. I, I do want to ask you about playing with Gilbert because there was some real synergy really between the two of you. Yeah. And the joke was, I don't know if it's a joke, it might actually be true, is Larry was the only one that could control Gil. Mm -hmm. What was it like playing with him? Man, that's, that's family. You know what I'm saying? So when you can have a relationship off the court and then you take that in between the lines and in the locker room, it's easier to to navigate. It's easier to have tough conversations. So when he was drafted, I was like the first guy that they called to have a conversation with him about spending all of his money before he got it. So this, our relationship goes way back until, you know, first time he actually, you know, stepped into Golden State in the Oakland. I was the first person that they called to like you said, keep him under control. See, so a lot, going. Yeah. See, a lot of people don't remember that Gil and Larry played at Golden State together before. And with Twan, right? Twan, with yeah. Twan yeah. before coming to the DC. That's what a lot of people forget. And now was it true? Because I, I know Gil from high school and just being around Gil from high school. And a lot of people don't know this. Gilbert was actually supposed to be like two years uh when he was a senior in high school, he was really like a sophomore. Yeah. Supposed to be a sophomore in high school. He was born in 1982. I was a late birthday, and Boozer was a late birthday at 81, but he was in a, a 99 graduating class. He could have been held back two more years and still been on time. So he was really young yeah. for his age. Oh, that explains it. Yeah. <laughs> yo, yeah, yeah. That probably has something to do with it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 But, yeah, yo, but, so, but coming into Arizona, it was only three guys wearing the number zero at the time. It was, I think, Jerome Mueso down in um, UCLA, myself at Kansas, and Gilbert Arenas was the number zero okay. in uh, Arizona. So me and him, he's always talking like, yo, like, I was the first to wear a zero. He's like, nah, I was the first to wear a zero. So we always had a little relationship like that. Now, how was Gil coming to Golden State at a very young age, second round pick? Yep. Second, Second round pick. pick. Yep. Um, kind of left, left. you know, said, forget school, I'm ready to go. Now, there was a rumor out there that he, like, bought a Bentley before his first contract. Was that what it was? Nah, he didn't buy a Bentley. What he did was this was a time when everybody was getting the Escalades. Got Remember it. when everybody was getting the Escalades? The 310? The 310. So it was like a $350,000 Escalade? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he had the carpet on the floor, the carpet on the roof, the carpet in the sun visor, the okay. TVs. So he, he did up an Escalade. But not only did he do it, but Escalade, he was also into um, aquatics and, and like like wild like animals, but we were talking fish. Yeah. So he bought this this crazy fish tank. Inside the Escalade? No, it wasn't. Oh, it, was, it, was, it was at his house. Okay, okay. It, was, it was at his okay. apartment. But the, the 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 aquarium, the fish tank, was worth more than the place that he was staying at. <laughs> so he had a car wow. that was worth more than what he was staying at, and he had a, a fish tank that was worth more than what he was staying at. That's so that, that, that explains Gary. Larry, I want to go back to the 04-05 season. You made first team all defense, and Drew, you'll appreciate this because – we're into the numbers. Larry averaged 2.89 hmm. steals, almost three a game. You might as well say 2.9, Chris. This man almost averaged three steals a game. <laughs> yeah. How about that? 
<laughs> the year, year, t- ten year multipliers. Yeah. Talk about that season because I think that was the season you guys beat Chicago in the first round, yep. and then you eventually lost, I think, to Miami in the yep. second. What was that season like for you? Uh, it was we were proving ourselves. Like you guys, like we we played together in Golden State, and we didn't win any games. I mean, we had streaks where we were losing 10, 12 games in a row. So for us to get together in D.C., now it was like, okay, we have to prove that we're able to to win. We're able to move an organization forward. We're able to contribute. So that's what it was about. It was about really us getting back together and then making sure that we made a difference. So the energy was good. Uh, we knew each other. Um, like you said, with the steals, I mean, we were just – Playing passing lanes, being aggressive, you know, communication at each time. We had Brendan back there, you know, a shot blocker. So we knew if we gambled, they had our backs. Um, you know, that whole big three and and the little two, like Jared Jeffrey started that. So we knew that we could kind of get away with things and take chances, and they would have our backs. So that allowed me to to get out there and take the chances. All right, so it's been a few years, so I'm gonna ask you the hard question that probably nobody would have asked you at the time. Who were you fighting with to make sure that you didn't get three steals a game? GA, man, GA went back and forth. Like we, I mean, it's a couple of pictures that I'm like right there and then he like right there. So we would talk, we would give like eye signals, like you go this time, I'll go next time. Like we'll switch from the top. Who's the person that's gonna take the top guy versus the wing guy. So we had him kind of down, man, as to how to get extra possessions and, and fight with each other in a good way to, to get steals. I mean, those, those teams were tough. Now, who was Eddie Jordan the head coach at the time? Yeah, Eddie Jordan was there. Man, I just remember having to guard that offense. It's just so much movement. It was like a Princeton style offense. I mean, they ran a, and Twan was ahead of his time, man. Yeah. Like, Twan was one of those guys at my position you just don't want to guard because you don't know what's going to happen. Is he going to pull a three? Is he going to give you a jump hook? If you close him out, it, he going to put it on the floor and create it to be a playmaker, and he could get you in foul trouble. So, I mean, it was just a tough offense to run in. When you add the defensive component to it with him and Gil, yep. like ninjas in the passing lane, yep. I mean, that was a, they were a tough team to deal with, and they had size, too. Uh, I think Jahadi was already – was Jahadi already gone? Heidi had left. Just left, okay. Yeah, he left the year before, yeah. Because I was saying, they had Jahadi, yeah, too. Yeah. I would have been like <laughs> – well, We did. I mean, we had size. Like, even like Twan. Like, Twan was that stretch four. Yeah. Right before the stretch four. And then even Jared Jeffries. Jared didn't necessarily shoot the ball well, but he would guard every guy on the court. And then he was a guy that would die from the, to the rim from the three-point line. It was – Eddie Jordan in the Princeton offense, we, we had a lot of success with that. Man, listen, I used to hate – Playing and get y'all in that first, especially in the playoffs when you was on my team, because I knew I wasn't gonna play that much that series. Cause Mike Brown did not trust me <laughs> guarding Antoine Jameson. And, and I, he's brought this up a few times. Okay. And, but you know what? But you know what? The older I get, the older I get, the more and more I accept it. You know what I'm saying? Because now that I'm thinking the game and seeing what was going on, we had Daniel Marshall on the team at the time. I think that was a better matchup for us that series. And when I looked at the numbers. Even though I was on the bench hating, like, why well, I'm not, not in the game right now. And I looked at the data, Dyer was balling. Yeah. Deep Marsh was balling and holding his own and came through for us. I mean, I think that was probably if it's, it was any series where you kind of saw a little glimpse of how today's game is being played, it was always against them. Yeah. I want to ask you before we get to when you guys became teammates, I want to go back to Chicago in the playoffs, the shot that Gil made, and then you guys ultimately came home and mm-hmm. clinched that series. What do you remember about that timeout and then seeing Gil hit that shot in Chicago? What were your thoughts? I think that play was for me. <laughs> that's I why, that, I, that's why I asked him. Larry was, was, was a great, great yeah. teammate. He heard, I think that he knew the play yeah. was for him, but yeah. he said, I think that play was for me. But it went in. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's my guy. Like if that's if, if he felt like he had it, even if the play was for me, I'm like, I roll with it. Right. Let's let's go. I mean, it, but it was because um, he struggled. But GA is one of those players that you give him the ball to someone on the line, you can expect him to make some happen. Yeah. But yeah, I mean we that was one of the series we wanted because we had an issue with them early on in the year. You know, you guys can go back and check that out. But we got into it with Chicago early on in the year. So once we seen them in the playoffs, we understand from being around the league for a few years that the intensity level goes up another level. So we were ready for the fight. That's why we made it to the second round, 
He was dead meat. I mean, we didn't have, we didn't have nothing left. We we kind of ran into this guy named Dwayne Wade and Shaq. And Shaq, oh, yeah. and Shaq. But we had to use all of that all of that energy. You know what I'm saying just to make sure that we made a mark and and you know set the tone as far as to how we were going to be going forward. Mm-hmm. I ended up leaving, but that was to send a message on how we would be. You know, going forward, and that's kind of a perfect transition when you talked about. Then you left going into that summer. We're not going to revisit history, but you ended up signing with Cleveland, yep. five-year, seventy million dollar contract. <clears throat> and I remember when you left, a lot of people in this town was like, "Can't let Larry go," and especially you can't let him go to Cleveland because yep. now you're playing next to LeBron, you got Drew, you got Z, you got those pieces. Was it hard to leave? Oh, it was definitely hard to leave. It was it was hard to leave, but but business will, will humble you, you know how you're perceived will, will humble you, and if you have another opportunity, then you know you take advantage of that opportunity. So that's that's really what it was, of kind of having the best of both worlds, and then having the chance to pick from from either one. Like Washington, I had the guys that I've been with, the guys that I knew, the system that I knew, the city that was you know starting to buzz, and then you had Cleveland with all of these these new pieces, this shiny new toy. A uh, new coach coming in kind of set the, the tone for going forward. So for me, it was like um, it was a win-win situation, but it was tough. Give us the inside because you were okay. his teammate. When you found out that Larry signed that five-year deal, he was rolling with you guys. What was the reaction of the team? Well, first of all, we needed a defender, and we saw how tough it was to play against those guys um, just during the regular season games, not even uh, before the playoffs even even you know happened in the future. So we already knew that that was a piece that we needed. And if we could pluck that piece away from DC, it was better for us. Our chances got a lot better getting past them if we ever got a matchup against them. So that was our whole mindset. And plus, Boog was one of the top free agents at the shooting guard position that, that season. A lot of people don't know. He, he was on the verge of being an all-star that year. 20 points, those steals. I believe first and second team all defense. First team. Yeah. First, <laughs> First team all defense, you see what I'm saying? So he was a, a big time signing. And Dane Ferry strategically plucked, I would say, Larry from the Wizards for to us. But let me tell you though, from my feeling, it was almost we were taking one of their brothers away forcefully. Cause as soon as he got to Cleveland, it was almost a sign and when you gonna trade me back yeah. kind, of, kind of situation. And I, I and I'm speaking and me and Larry ain't never talked about this, but I think, honestly, I don't think it was the right fit for him in, in Cleveland. I feel like we took their brother doing free agency, which was a win-win situation. Money talks, you feel me? Show me where the money at. He made the right decision on that, but I don't think it was the right basketball decision for where he was coming from. I think that team with Larry beats us. And you were going through some personal stuff too that season, which is obviously difficult. And a lot of people at home, they see you guys as performers. But what I've learned during my time covering you guys, as long as I have, is y'all have personal lives too. And you deal with the same stuff that us normal people deal with. Oh, yeah, for sure. So my my brother was going through, uh, he was born with a a heart defect. So it was coming to, he had a heart transplant. So it was coming through the years, through the later years, we would probably need uh, another heart transplant. And if... Remember, Cleveland Clinic was one of the yep. leading hospitals regarding, you know, oh, heart wow. surgeries and things of that nature. So that was really the pitch. And if you guys know me, I mean, I play ball, we good, but, you know, I do it for my family. Yep. So when I got that pitch, that was added into the fold of getting the best doctors, getting the best treatment, figuring out, you know, how do we make this life longer? And I'm mm-hmm. like, let's, well, let's, go, let's go do that. Yeah. Like, let's go do that. But again, speaking of the team aspect, I knew the ins and outs of the offense. I knew the city. I was so it was a good fit for me on the basketball court. But like you said, when you think about life and different things that I needed to do to make sure that my family was good, it was a win win because of a Cleveland Clinic too. And now we get to round one of three straight years, first round playoffs, yeah, Wizards Cavs. Now the first year, as you guys know, I was with y'all. I was covering the Cavs in that series. So my perspective of the first year was a little different. Yeah, yeah. I was in Cleveland with y'all. Although I did pick the Wizards in six games in that first year. I, oh, hey, but well, check this out. You weren't that far <laughs> off. I wasn't the data. You wasn't that far off. I didn't even know those games were that close. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. So when you guys saw that matchup, let's go to the first year. When you saw that you guys were playing Washington, your reaction to it was clearly different than probably yours. But both of you guys, give me a sense of what you thought about that matchup. It's a four or five matchup. So right there, that lets you know ain't no favorite. It's, it's who's going to come out the smoke. You know what I mean? We were right in the middle of the pack, round one. And the weather just broke. You know, we in Cleveland, so we got harsh, harsh winters. We don't see the sun for six months. <laughs> you know what I mean? We coming out all light skin. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so you get to DC, weather's, you know, the cherry blossoms up out, and weather's warm. We rolling with Bug. He know all the spots are. You know what I'm saying? He just left DC. And it was funny because it was one of the series where we'll be playing against each other on the court. But we'd be up Dang, hanging yeah. out at nighttime, both teams be together, kicking at the same table, you know what I mean? So it was it was like it was a love and hate relationship in that series, and but it grew. It grew to that point. <clears throat> I had a, I had a good friend on that team, Deshaun Stevenson, excuse me. And uh so that was my little connection. And I had the, the history with Gilbert Arenas being the same uh, draft class, excuse me, not draft class, high school class with him, just knowing him throughout the years. So I had those relationships too, and then Bud kind of like just pieced us all together because it was nowhere. If Bronny was going somewhere, Bud was going somewhere. I was with them, you know what I'm saying? So we were inseparable. It just so happens when we played DC, we was in the spots at the same time. But when we stepped foot on that court, we couldn't stand each other. I mean, it was going for blood. And when you look at those stats, I know y'all gonna bring them up. I mean, it was three games, I believe, decided by one point. Yep. Is that right? That's right. Battle. That's unbelievable. Yeah, that's a and, yeah. and it was high scoring. Some of them high scoring. I think one got up to 125, where some playoff series, if you look at it during that time, when we were going against Detroit, was 87-92. Yeah. So this is, it, it ain't print. It, it's kind of, it's something like Golden State with some Princeton yeah. offense. You know what I mean? What did you think? So, end of the season, you see it. You see the first round opponent. Do you call GA? Was there any talk before the series started? No, it wasn't really talk. Like we didn't necessarily trash talk either. He would trash talk around me. GA <laughs> <laughs> like, like, no, like he would trash talk around me. But he, that's that's part of him. But I know playoff series, you gotta have an edge. Like it's something that you have to create within your team that you're gonna go and battle against the other team. So my edge was. I know all the plays. I know all the tendencies. So those are the conversations that I was having with my teammates like. You dry snitching. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of, course. Really, of course. Now that I think about it, he was running the shoot around. Yeah, I was running the shoot around. Coach Mike Malone. Yeah. Well, coach Mike Malone was the head coach at Denver now, was our assistant, main top assistant, do all the plays, pro personnel, everything. Him and Boog was walking us through shoot around through yeah. everything. So I knew, I knew everything. I knew the play. I knew once this player go, go go over this space, they running forwards out, or they running, you know. Shake action. That, so I, I knew I knew the play. So when we were, uh, they were calling something out. I'm yelling out to the team. Shan fourteen. So that's the little little game you play to get them thinking about, you know, what you know what we know, what they think they're trying to run. So that was, that was the fun part about it. Well, I just remember for game one. I was sitting in the four hundred section because that's how they did the media. <laughs> <laughs> and it was LeBron's first playoff game. And I remember going to practice, and I used to always talk to him, and we'll get to that in a moment, and, and all these years later, look what we're doing right. now. But he was always a go-to soundbite. And I, I was going to say some wow, yeah, you yeah. already know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad social media wasn't really then. He, he wouldn't be here now. He'd be a superstar somewhere. But I always remembered you guys were always saying, uh, he's definitely ready. <laughs> his very first game was a triple double. Like, what do you remember about that LeBron? Where that was the first playoff opportunity that he had. I remember he was excited. Like, I remember he was excited like a kid. Like, you know, what I'm saying like he is a historian. Like, he understands the history. He understands he understood from day one when he got into the league what he was trying to accomplish. Like, he's been locked into what he's been trying to accomplish. So, I, that's that's what I seen. I mean, I, I saw him. Um, going to do everything possible, whether it's a good shot, bad shot, mm -hmm. whatever it was, he was yeah. going to do everything possible to win a series and to win a game. So, I mean, that's that's, that's and, yeah, and we was kind of 
bound to kind of roll with it because I mean, because later on we kind of seen the development of that because it kind of helped us in Detroit. <laughs> yeah. You know that game was a game five, game six, game five, points. Yeah, yeah, game five, yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, I had to see. I saw it firsthand from being there already two years, or actually one year. The year that I wasn't there was uh, my rookie year or my second year. They didn't make the playoffs with that team. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Silas gets another crack at it. We don't make the playoffs my first year there. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, my second year there, we got some action. You see what I'm saying? We starting to get some action and it's starting to get that, you know, getting closer and closer to the playoffs. We actually – Missed the game. We were one game away from the playoffs the year before that, so I knew we're how. In Toronto. We were in Toronto. Yeah. We had the it was a, it was the difference between the Nets and the and the Celtics. We needed the Nets to lose because they owned the tiebreaker. I never forget. Boston was up twenty five points at half. I'm like, oh, we're in the offs. We just gotta win this game. We win this game. We in Toronto walking back, asking what the score was, asking the, the score, scores table, what's the score of the other game. Because you really couldn't get the information that quick uh, uh, back then. And then I remember they told us the score. They said, yeah, Jersey up 15. I said, and that's what started the Boston Celtics rival with Cleveland. Because they wanted to stick it to us. They didn't want us in the playoffs. So they set everybody down. Uh, all the big three, Paul Pierce, everybody, KG, they set everybody up down when they were 20, up 25. Wow. Game six of that first series. Timeouts called whatever, how much time is left. Did you two, at any point in your mind, think Damon Jones is going to close this series out in the corner? <laughs> nah, but he he talked like he, he ain't was. confident. He <laughs> ain't confident. So, so yeah, when, when he did it, you got to be like, yep, he said he was going to do it. Because whether he was serious or whether he was joking or not, you always knew D. Jones was ready to take the last shot. Make or miss, mm -hmm. big shot, first quarter, last, you know, end of the game. D. Jones is going to take the shot. Is this true? He he had a license plate made after that? 4.3. <laughs> he had <laughs> shoes made that said 4.3 on them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, listen. Yes, that, sir. The first day when we signed Damon Jones, he came up from Miami. He had a successful season in Miami. We signed him to a three-year deal, I believe. I think it was a three-, four-year deal. And uh, he comes in. He, and he writes on the board, <laughs> top shooters in the world. <laughs> number one, Damon Jones. Number two, Damon Jones. Remember that? Number three, Damon Jones. I think like four was like dirt. <laughs> oh, good times, man. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I got to ask you two about this. Do you guys know the significance of February 21st, 2008. February 21st, 2008. So I was, oh yeah, we got traded. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, we got traded. Yeah, yeah. I was, we was on a plane, on a United plane, leaving out of Hopkins. That's crazy, I remember this day, we was on a plane, me, him, Shannon Brown. Yeah, I did that. Yeah. I did that, I don't think them guys, those guys wanted to leave Cleveland. But I had situations with my family, with my brother, I lost my brother. And I couldn't function in Cleveland. Like it did, every day, I, it was just it wasn't it wasn't going to work. So I wanted to be moved, and those guys, including me, yeah, they got they got thrown into that deal. Which, you know, we haven't really talked, but that's the kind of stuff that you like some feel bad about. Like if 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 one player needs to move because they need a situation, to have another player thrown in that where they got to uproot their family and make a change, like that's the, that's the hard part of making a personal decision. But for me, I think that that's what that's what that was. On a low, I was kind of 50-50 with it. I was all like, yeah, I'm kind of shocked that I, um, I got traded. But then I looked at it as an opportunity to get out that dunker spot. Yeah. You feel me? I, I looked at it as an You've opportunity. You've always talked to me about there was more to your game than just that, the, that what I had to do. And I think Boog could, could talk about that. I mean, it was specific duties I had with the Cleveland Cavaliers. I mean, I was having like 10, only 10 points and people thought that was the best year of my season. I was only averaging 10 points, but it was a specific role I had to play. When I got to Chicago, now you got to see the mid-range game. Now you got to see my ones and being a priority 
offensively within the offense. So I kind of looked at it as an opportunity to kind of leave out of LeBron's shadow and go spread my wings. So I, I took it as a positive, and I was, I was ready to move on. And once somebody crossed that line with me, especially a guy like Danny Ferry, you know, I was ready to go. So. Go. <laughs> so, so when you said, I, we talked about there's a business side and that personal side, though. You said you guys were on the plane when you found out about it? No. I was actually getting a tattoo with Shannon Brown. <laughs> we were all in Cleveland. Yeah, we, were, we were all in Cleveland, like kind of looking at the ticker. I mean, I, I told them guys, well, they knew. Something about to pop off. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He just, yeah. yeah it was, I was like, I, I got I got to go. So, you know, they knew once I said I got to go, and it was probably going to happen. So we were all in Cleveland kind of. I know I was at home watching it. Then once it came across, then we, you know, called Goody and called SB. Yeah. It was like, we got it. Time to go. And to add to that, the other reason why I wasn't mad is because this was the same team I just talked to in free agency that was ready to ex extend me to a nice size deal. So I was like, oh, this is going to give me an opportunity to really go get this bread because I took a big pay cut trying to stay in Cleveland. I mean, when you talk about having to negotiate, playing around LeBron James and want to stay on that stay on that gravy train, people got to make sacrifices around there, you know what I mean, with, with numbers. So I took it as an opportunity. But – um uh, book, I was just more, I, I had a, it was a feeling in my heart for Boog because he was going through a lot on and off the court, you know, with injuries, you know, family situation with his brother. Uh, I was actually happy he got out of Cleveland. I was happy for him. So now that I think about it, I, I was cool with Detroit. I want to transition to <clears throat> the legacy that you set for players coming out of St. Louis. And here recently, we just did a feature on Bradley Beal and his AAU team, and obviously the St. Louis Eagles, who you know mm -hmm. quite well. And to see some of these players that have come from the Lou, when you think of Jason Tatum, and how much of like an OG do you watch the games now and go, they come from where I come from? Oh, to, to the utmost. I mean, and I, I embrace that, that tag now as far as OG because that means that you, you've paved the way. Like you've shown the direction to go. And I continue to talk to those guys. I continue to support those guys because again, like we are from the same place. And millions of basketball players in this, you know, in this world. And when you get a, a group of, of guys that have made it to the highest level in that sport, I mean you can't uh, you know you can't discount that. You gotta you gotta give credit to not only myself for being one of the early ones but those guys are taking it to another level. Like those guys, you know, with the, you know, with the content creation and all the media things that are out there, I mean, you know, those guys are Boston broadcasting worldwide. So that's only more attention and more uh, accolades that the city gets because they represent where we come from too. Like I don't know, you know, many interviews or many sit downs where those guys haven't said where they're from, and. When we do that, we allow our young guys in the city to hear that and they get a chance to take pride in that and then they want to carry that. Right. So that's how we keep it going. And we got more, man. We got more in the city. So it's like, you know, somebody's doing the right thing. Brad is 160 points away become, before becoming the franchise leader in points. You saw him when he was. Yeah. What is your earliest recollection of Brad Beal? Uh, you know, Brad, so Brad went to Shamanai, which is, uh, I went to CBC High School, which is a rival high school in the, in the uh, Metro Catholic Conference in, uh, in St. Louis. So I've always known Brad to shoot the basketball. That's what, you know, when I was coming back from playing or, you know, get a note or get a clip or see videos or talk to the AAU coaches about like who's, you know, who's coming up, it was Brad can shoot the basketball. So that was my expectation. So every time I saw Brad, even early on in the, in the league, um, I would talk to him about adding more to his game. And I feel like that's what he's done. He's added a lot to his game. Uh, he's only getting better. To be 160 points away from uh, being an all-time leading scorer within an organization that's had so many great players come through, uh, so much rich, hit, rich history, uh, this changed uh, names. Um, I mean, that's huge. But uh, you, you go across the Bullets and also the Wizards as having you know, your name on top. And I think that that's, that's cool. A lot of people don't know your relationship with Jason Tatum. Can you explain? Because 
I remember as little boy <laughs> used to be at me and Abe, which is Larry's cousin, on our days off, used to take this little boy to the practice facility and get up shots. And that little boy turned out to be Jason Tatum. Can you explain why he was in Cleveland? What was he doing there? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, his pops, we grew up. So we grew up together, uh, started playing basketball at 14. Okay. So one of my longest, you know, lasting relationships, uh, a guy I know like the back of my hand, and that's his son. Mm -hmm. So I was there for the, you know, Bird. from the start to the, you know, to yeah. now, right? I was there with the Pampers and I was there with checking on the mom after, you know, Lil yeah. J came home. We, so I, I've been there, you know, from you the got beginning. daddy from from the beginning, from the beginning. I'm I'm more so of a supporter. Like that's a that's a, a, a tag, that's a title, and what I like to. And I have multiple God kids. Mm -hmm. All of my homeboys, they they know when it come to me, the Godfather. I got it. Anything transpire, anything go wrong, anything needs to happen. That's my role. So when I see Lil J, I, I watch Boston games whenever they play. Not for the fact that, you know, I want to give any sort of insight. It's just for the fact that I want to see him and I want to support him. So from now until forever, I got it. Yeah. You know, and even though he's making four hundred, five hundred million dollars, he ain't gonna need. You know it's, what going, I mean? it's going up more. Yeah, he, he ain't gonna really need that sort of support. But any other support, you know what I'm saying? That's what I'm here for. But it was crazy because when I put two and two together, I was like, wait a minute. That's him. <laughs> That's him. He was being in the backseat of my car, going to the practice facility like at night, getting up shots. Trying to chase Bron around, man. I would always get a call that, you know, he started playing, his, his, his high school started playing, his AU team started playing, he started traveling a little bit, and I, you know, left Cleveland or whatnot, and I would always get a call to, you know, Lil Jay is such and such. He wanted to holler at Bron. So I called Randy, got to get Randy on. Randy, they in Memphis right now. They coming in the court after y'all. Let Lil Jay holler, holler, holler at Bron. We get that done. So it's like those sort of connections, like this was early on. Like those sort of connections, those sort of relationships, having them up in Cleveland doing the playoffs, getting a chance for him to see that sort of environment. I think all of that stuff matters in these young people's lives. Like what they can go back on and, and think about what they've seen and like Shit, I've seen it yeah. I've seen it I, I can do it you know what I'm saying so, so what were you two thinking when Tatum dumped on Braun in the playoffs <laughs> like that and he patted him on the back I hope, he took, I hope he took that phone call <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he knows man I think for me like you represent what you're supposed to represent when you did that you represent from where you come from like there's guys in this league that will shy away from that opportunity. They'll make try some crazy shot. They won't attack to the fullest. But, you know, I think that that's a testament to where he's where he's come from as well. Because he's not gonna back down. He's uh he's 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 gonna be one of the greatest men to play. I wanna get one of the Jordan Goodwin his flowers, also yep. a kid from St. Louis, yep. played for BBE. He plays defense that kind of reminds me of you where he gets to it. Yep. Yep, he's always been that way always been that way he's always been been labeled a dog and not in a bad way you know what i'm saying he's always been that way he's always been uh in the trenches uh leading rebounder from you know from a guard position leading offensive rebounder from a guard mm -hmm. position like the only thing he was lacking was the confidence on the offensive end and yeah, exactly. you got high school does not play like college college does not play like the nba but certain things that these you know these guys do in college it may look different in the NBA. So he got his chance in the NBA. A lot of people didn't expect for him to, to make it where he's made it. So sh shout out to, to Jay Good, man. My last question before, if you got anything, is, uh, you know, when you get older and you cover guys and then you end up seeing their kids yeah. and you end up seeing their kids playing basketball, yeah. that's kind of a cool moment for me, man. What is it like for you guys to kind of see like the next generation of basketball players that you have helped not only create, but cultivate. Yeah. Well, sometimes you don't get your money's worth like I did because you got Aaron Gordon out of nowhere come snatch blocking your, your shot out of nowhere in a real life game. I was like, man, that's where, I'm, this is where my money going to. <laughs> see these guys up here to come take my job, you know what I mean? But uh, it's a beautiful thing though. 
to know that now when I had that talk, I used Aaron Gordon as an example because he played on my AAU team. He's kind of like more the, the poster boy for me, really being hands-on, involved with the family, his brother, who was actively playing overseas right now. So I know the family from that standpoint. I, I just, it's a breath of fresh air to see that I had something to do with that. Like, I helped him. And then I didn't realize it until he told me yeah. as an adult, like, if it wasn't for you, man, I, if I couldn't see it, like Boog was talking about it, I wouldn't probably knew how to apply this. But he was able to see it real time, had the conversations, knowing that we knew LeBron, Brown would come back and watch the games, having those connections for these kids because it's huge. But um, I'd like to say, man, good seeing you. You look great, still in shape, still look like you hey, good. I don't know about 2.89 steals, but – Hey, I'm a, I'm a spot. Yeah, I can I can I can steal that thing. I can, I'm smart. I'm still smart. Now. I'm still <laughs> smart. Got faster. Yes, I, I'm still smart, man. I, I see things now, man. I'm like, yeah, I can I can I can get that. Yeah. Uh, I, I see how he passed the ball across his body. I can I can yeah. get that. Yeah. So yeah. I'm still in the game. Like you said, I'm, I'm my son is playing now, so I'm watching him. What's that like? It's fun. Like it, it, it's fun. It's fun because he puts the time in. Like he he puts the time in. We talk all the time about you know being a former players, you know, kid and, and you know, the, the thoughts around that or how, you know, he could be perceived as, as you know, kids having the easy way. And he, he's one that, that, like, works. Like, so that's that's refreshing for me because there's some other things that he could do other than obviously play basketball. He's a great student and all that stuff, but he could, could have picked another sport. And just to see him develop and want to do it and start to, you know, hear stories because we don't I don't really talk about what I did like you got to figure it out you got to go see it that no it's youtubeable yeah yeah it's not my thing to tell you sit down and tell you so you got to go check it out but it's it's been a blessing and refreshing to see these young people come up and try to put their hand in you know put their hand in they they, they had in the hand well it's an honor for me um to sit here with you two maybe not so much (laughs) Larry, you meant a lot to a lot of people in this community, man. And I know as we celebrate 25 years, a lot of these guys have come back. Yeah. Just know that you've had a very powerful impact on people in this community. Welcome home. Oh, man, appreciate it. Absolutely. I appreciate it, man. I, I definitely feel it. I definitely feel it. So it, that doesn't go uh, unnoticed. I'm always willing to, to come back to the city because these are my people. When people ask me where's the, the my favorite place to play, it's two because I won a lot of games in Cleveland. But, you know, D.C. is is definitely one of my favorites. Respect. Absolutely, brother. Yeah.